Welcome back to Coach to Scale. Today I'm chatting with Michelle Benford, and she's dropping some powerful insights on leadership and potential. Michelle recently found an old letter from her dad, yeah, from 1993, where he laid out a playbook for her success, reminding her to aim high and stay mentally tough. That shaped her whole approach to leadership. Check out that post on LinkedIn. Now, Michelle's all about creating playbooks for her team, whether you're a manager on the front lines or a director driving big picture results. We'll talk about breaking free from the sink or swim mindset, how scorecards can keep managers sharp, and why your career is more of a zigzag than a straight line. The episode is all about unlocking potential and getting real about leadership. Let's jump in with Michelle. Let's go. Welcome to Coach to Scale, how modern leaders build coaching cultures. I'm your host, Matt Benelli. Join me as we build a community of like-minded professionals who share the belief that effective coaching improves the performance of every team member. Our mission is to help leaders become better coaches. The Coach to Scale podcast is sponsored by Coachum, the world's first AI coaching execution platform that leverages evidence-based coaching to increase quota attainment. And with that, let's get started. Today's guest believes that one should look at their career as a portfolio of accomplishments and a collection of skills versus the linearity, say, of the corporate ladder. And she's led from the front on this. She's built and led teams at super successful companies, Log Me In, HubSpot, and currently she's the SVP of revenue at Bill. She's also a fellow Stage 2 Capital LP and Boston College Eagle, as well as a proud graduate of Boston Latin. I saw that on your LinkedIn profile. Michelle Benfer, welcome to Coach the Scale. Thank you, Matt. I'm super excited to be here. And uh, based on the post that we had talked about previously, I I felt compelled to put the Boston Latin in there as a shout out to your dad. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Yes, he was a big fan of ensuring that I included my high school on um, my my resume as well as uh, LinkedIn, but mostly because I don't know if you're familiar, Matt, but it's the first public high school in the United States. So um, it's still it's still doing well, founded in 1635. So it's certainly a, a proud alumna. Absolutely. And uh, Patrick Ewing, uh, I think, was the famous basketball player in, in Boston that went to uh, Boston Latin. I, I could be wrong about that. I think it was Cambridge Ridge in Latin. And as I was saying it, I knew I screwed it up, but <laughs> we won't edit it out. We'll leave the screw up in there. All good. So Michelle, let's get right into it. Even leading and coaching people at a high level at different companies. You've heard it all. You've heard all these myths. What's a myth about coaching salespeople and sales leaders that you believe is misguided or maybe even complete BS? Yeah, I love this question, Matt. I actually just got off a meeting with, uh, I had an all hands with all of my frontline manager uh, team, and I shared with them that they, I really believe this, they're the most important role that we have in a sales organization is the frontline sales managers. Um, I think there's a couple of myths in there. Uh, The first one is kind of the sink or swim mentality. And I think sometimes I've seen managers throughout my time who have said, I have a rep who stinks. Uh, They didn't ramp in time. They're not performing, you know, they have the inputs, but they don't have the quality of their conversations. I think it's time for us to move to a pip. And I think the manager actually has to take a look at themselves. Did they hire right? Are they ramping effectively? Have they dedicated enough time to making sure that this rep is successful? Are they coaching them on the quality of the conversations that they're having? And also, is the manager getting this this person up and running so that they can operate on their own versus the manager being a super rep and making sure that they are getting the deals closed on behalf of the rep? So, you know, the myth there is uh, the manager's there to oversee players versus the manager's there to develop and ensure that they're hiring the right players for their team, developing those players, and ideally getting them in a position to promote. Yeah, I think it's an excellent point. A lot of times, uh, you know, I've been in around leaders who say, uh, look, I hired this person and he or she's been doing this for a long time. You know, they should know what to do. And I think we both know the the problem with with looking at it that way. Uh, I also wonder, Michelle, do you think that there's a, a good number of managers who don't put that person on a PIP, but might 
refrain from, from doing so or taking appropriate corrective action with the rep because they almost feel guilty they, because they didn't do much to coach or develop that person. So they look at it themselves and, and, and kind of just let it, let it just go, let it just keep perpetuating. Oh, all day long. I, and I also think, you know, there were some managers who are just, they're afraid to, they're afraid to have direct conversations. You know, conflict uh, can be tough just for people in general. I think there are some managers who try to gain trust by being a friend. And so again, when they're in a tough position, they're afraid to have those direct conversations. And I also think a lot of uh, managers haven't been properly trained on how to performance manage effectively. That includes proactive performance management and catching underperformance, risks of underperformance, you know, early enough. And, um, you know, Matt, you made a comment a, a moment ago about managers saying, you know, this person, I hired them from a great company. They should know they should be able to do this job. I mean, listen, even A-Rod went through slumps right? You see like excellent, excellent athletes in these professional sports that sometimes they're not, they're not on their A game. And so it doesn't matter where someone came from. It doesn't mean that they might be in a new environment. They're trying to get their feet wet. The pitch, they just haven't nailed it yet. They don't know the product inside and out. They don't know the systems inside and out. So it's really on the manager to diagnose what is it that they have to coach that rep up on so that the manager does not have to be a super rep. I agree with you 100% on that. I'm fine with a fraud going through slumps, um, <laughs> but but I, as a as a proud Bostonian, but I I, I do uh, agree with with the point that you're making. It, it actually, good segue because we're talking about stuff other than numbers right now. So in in the sales and sales leadership world, uh, promotions aren't a given. How do you focus on who gets promoted in your organizations? Is it all about the numbers? Yeah. So, so interesting, uh, interesting question. So when I was at HubSpot, we had a formulaic uh, promo process and there were a lot of reasons why I liked it. So to answer your question, it was all based on the numbers. You know, you had to hit 110% on average over the trailing 12 months. You need to have your retention numbers strong to make sure that you were bringing in healthy units. And so you would automatically trigger for a promotion. There was a lot I liked about that. It was uh, clean cut. Everyone knew what they needed to do. It was a meritocracy. Um, it was also really good when it came to um, ensuring that there was fairness when it came to who got promoted. And I think the impetus of that promo pathing at HubSpot was to make sure there wasn't favoritism, which... We'll be honest, right? We see that in a lot of sales works, whether there's a manager who had someone they went to high school with or college with, or it's their brother's best friend. You know, we want to make sure that there's equity in how people get the job done. So I do really like that. The problem with that on the flip side is sometimes you have people that maybe aren't, uh, aren't the best team players. And so, you know, sometimes you might see some people get promoted that they are um, culture detractors, not additive to the culture. And so, you know, I, I think in that vein, there is a level of balance that needs to be considered. I am a fan, though, especially for reps of uh, the elements of consistency paying off and having this automated promo path. I'm, I'm a fan of that motion. Great points. I mean, I, I get the formulaic approach at HubSpot and, and I didn't even think of it from a, a favoritism standpoint, but that's a real thing. Um, but, you know, the other points that you mentioned too, in, in a, an earlier conversation when you and I chatted, you talked about the importance of making an outsized impact. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that for, for the audience? Sure, sure. So, uh, so what I was just referencing there on, on reps getting promoted, uh, that's the one that was really this formulaic path. What I like about managers getting promoted, what I like about directors getting promoted is measuring outsized impact. So uh, as you mentioned, and let me, um, let me uh, qualify that a, a little bit more. I think a lot of leaders, when they're first overseeing a team, they think if I hit my number, I'm, I did a great job. And in my view, hitting your number means uh, you landed into expectation land, right? Like we deliver an OTE which is base salary plus commission 
If you hit 100%, you got paid what we told you we'd pay you, right? Mm -hmm. That's baseline expectation. You don't get a high five for that. Uh, You get a like, yeah, way to go. You you hit our expectation. Over and above that is uh, outsized impact. So one performance certainly can be, right? Were you 110% to your number? Were you 120, 125? Were you number one compared to their other managers? Sure, performance might be outsized impact. But besides that, it's are you impacting the organization in a way that benefits others? So if you are a sales manager, are you figuring out that there is a routing issue that actually is slowing down the ability for the entire team to work their leads? That might be one example. That's a small one. Um, Another one might be, hey, I realize that there is a segment that we're starting to win more deals from. And if we just bought the, you know, added this one product feature, I think we could actually improve our conversion rate by this, this, and this. Could I make a proposal to the product team? Could we work on quantifying that we can actually bolster the product in this way or another? And so when I think about outsized impact, it's are you expanding impacts beyond your team and are you expanding your impact across the business? So there are a lot of examples in there and, and some of it starts with just ensuring that your managers and your directors have competency benchmarks and what those expectations look like in being a holistic uh, leader throughout the organization. So outsized impact, it's, it's not just going through the motions. It's not just banging out the numbers that's table stakes. It's what are you doing to make this place better, right? What are you doing to make it, you know, better and easier for everybody else? You know, how do we, how do we just do things better? A lot of what you're talking about relies seemingly on, on data. How important is data when leading a sales org? I would say it's the most important thing after talent, right? Talent can get you so far. Listen, I'm biased. I've worked in high velocity, high volume sales organizations for the last too many years for me to name that will, that will give away my age. But yeah, I mean, at least, you know, 15, 20 years, Matt, and um, data just, that helps inform so much on, on the smaller scale, just stack ranking your team, right? If you have 20 reps who are doing the same job, what is their average deal size? What is their conversion rate? What is their pipeline coverage? Where are they to their number month to date? You know, whatever you, you think of are those top leading and potentially lagging indicators, stack ranking those, getting that out, you know, week over week, being able to quickly diagnose, hey, Matt, you are working your tail off. You're number one in activity, but you're not hitting your number. Let's take a look at why some of your, your buddies are hitting their number uh, and they're actually not working as hard as you are. We got to get your deal size up. Let's listen to the gong call and let's understand how are you doing your pricing and, and positioning? Are you targeting the right kinds of prospects? Data is what points you in the direction if you're a manager on how to coach more effectively and where to coach. So it's really like a a great precision indicator. Well, I love what you said about you're working hard, you're doing more activity, but you're not getting the results that your your buddies are. Let's listen to the gong call. What you what you didn't say there is what a lot of managers say is, hey, Michelle. Your numbers are up. You got to get your numbers up. You got to get your average deal size up and then walk away, right? Like, oh, okay, great. Thanks a lot. Now what? Captain Obvious. How do I do that? Well, you talked about digging into the tech, leveraging the technology to do the coaching, to figure out exactly how to do it. Michelle, how can data be used to hold people accountable without becoming that dreaded micromanager? Yeah, uh, I was, I'm actually going through this at uh, Bill right now with the Bill management team and just we're putting, you know, new variables front and center and uh, leading indicators. Uh, I think everyone across the organization, uh, if you are a leader, you have to set the tone for the fact that data gives us insights. It doesn't say you're bad. It doesn't say you're good. It just tells you how you're operating and benchmarks you against others in ways in which we can help you make more money. You were a sales rep. My guess is you're somewhat money motivated, right? And my hope is that you're an ambitious person and you want your career to move uh, to move up quickly. And so if your manager and the organization can show you, hey, this is where your data is telling you you're doing well. This is where your data is telling you you got maybe a weakness. Let's talk about it and let's figure out how we can help make you better. 
you know, like any any sport or anything you need to do in order to improve a weakness, it might take more time up front to develop the muscle, strengthen the muscle of an area that you're weak. It might take more work. Once you get that muscle strengthened, you know, ideally it will be smoother sailing after that. And so um, I think the great managers spend their time using data on helping their people develop stronger skills pointing out the data and using it as a, you were bad, you were good, get better. That's a lazy, lazy manager. Um, and so, you know, it's time to evolve. Well, it's when you, when you think about it that way, the data is objective. The data is not emotional. It's not like, Hey, I think that you're struggling. You know, I, I think that you're lazy because you're not making enough calls. It's just, Hey, I'm, I'm looking at it right here and it says this, well, why do you think it does? Right. So it, it maybe helps take emotion out of that conversation. So I, I really appreciate that point. We're talking about stack ranking reps and, and having these conversations. What about with, with managers? I actually, I think stack ranking managers is one of the most effective tools for mobilizing a sales organization. So at various points uh, throughout my career, I've had manager scorecards and also just manager dashboards that are manager uh, versus manager. This is particularly helpful if you have larger organizations. And so I've had upwards of hundreds of managers under me. And ideally, you want to stack rank managers in a way that it's apples to apples compared to their competitive set, if you will. And so if you have one director who has you know, five managers, you're using those five managers against each other. Um, but some of my favorite benchmarks for manager health are you know, closing out a month, what percent of your reps were over 100%, what percent of your, of your reps were 90 to 99%, what percent of your reps were below 90%. And over time, if you take a look at that stat you know, over the last month, over a trailing three months, six months, 12 months, you are really going to see the managers who have healthy teams versus the managers who are riding the coattails of a couple of really strong players. As a director or a VP, you then are using that data to figure out how to coach that manager. Are you hiring the right people? Are you developing the people that are underneath? Let's take a look at the stats of the other reps and how they're performing, you know, that's different than the top performers. So. I love the manager scorecard. Um, another one, Matt, that I also really like is looking at manager activity in Gong or Chorus or HubSpot, you know, whatever, whatever your conversational intelligence tool might be. But are they scoring calls? Are they listening to calls? You know, are they joining calls? They, they have some great stats. I actually think uh, that is a tool that is under leveraged when it comes to measuring manager connection to listening to the quality of the conversations of their reps. I, I wish I had that when when I was a rep or certainly when I was a first line manager. And, you know, there's so many different things that you can do with it, especially in a world where a lot of people are remote. Right. And it's just it just gives so much information. But being able to listen to those calls. So if you're listening to my calls. Michelle, you know what I'm doing well and where I might be struggling. And so if I'm doing all the work, if I'm putting the behavior and the activity in and I'm not getting the result and I say, why do you think that is? You can have a point of view, not just guess. So uh, we talk a lot about the success that, that people have. You've had a ton of success, but what's a painful lesson you learned in this crazy business somewhere along the way? Great question. I'll give you a couple. Uh, definitely have a few battle scars, Matt. Yeah. Uh, uh, so I'll, I'll tell you, so I think you have to be a collaborative player and the reality, you know, I don't mean to generalize, but a lot of sales leaders, uh, we're impatient. We are bullish, uh, sometimes a bit of a bull in a China shop when we're working with other departments around us. And, um, we want everything we need right now. And you know, I had a um, a 360 review not too long ago. They interviewed 21 people for 30 minutes each. And I got this big packet of 360 feedback. And the number one piece of feedback I received was, I'm a very authentic leader. Po that was positive feedback. 
uh, the number one piece of feedback I received that was negative was that I was an inauthentic leader. How about that? Right. Talk about polarizing. Uh, it, so it was like my mind blown emoji. And I went to my CEO, Yamini at HubSpot, who was my manager at the time. And I'm like, what am I supposed to think about this? As I parsed through the comments, you know, one of the things I could sense was that the people I worked most closely with on a day in, day out basis felt like I was really authentic leader. For those who I didn't work with as often, maybe I had a monthly sync, maybe I needed them on the fly. They felt as though I worked very transactionally so that when I needed something from them, I came in hot. Hey, can you get me this? And I didn't really spend the time nurturing and building relationships and or didn't feel that way. Whereas the people I worked with every day, I was probably asking them, tell me about your kids. Tell me about your weekend. What's going on with your team? And so I had that trust built. And so anyways, one of those hard lessons was that um, you might feel as though you have trust and credibility throughout the organization. You have to understand that people receive you in different ways. And especially, I think, different types of personalities that might live in different other parts of the organization, which is very different than the sales leader, right, or the sales team. So, so that's one. The other one I, I would mention is be bold, but cautious. And so, you know, it's funny, those might seem like they are um, on opposite ends of the spectrum, but I've worked in organizations that have engines that are very finely tuned engines. And if you can, if you make a misstep in an engine in something that might really disrupt uh, your financial plan, that could ha have a real major impact on the way that you're overall operating. And so what I mean by cautious is be bold. If, if, if you have a hypothesis, for example, I think we can grow in Canada. I think, you know, more than we are today. I think we can really build out an outbound team that's going to focus on these kinds of prospects. Be bold, take chances, but do it cautiously. Don't, don't pivot an entire team there that you're really relying on their revenue. You're going to have to experiment. You're going to have to test. And so, you know, be deliberate. Know what you're measuring. What, what's your success criteria? Uh, make bold moves, but you got to be cautious and make sure that you don't miss plan and you got to balance the two at the same time. Makes a ton of sense there. So I ask this question sometimes and I, I wax and wane on it because sometimes it comes off as a little corny or fluffy, but I want to ask it because uh, I, I think it can be interesting. It's, it's human, right? What motivates you really? Like what, what drives you? So I'm a goal setter. And so at various points in my life, I've had different goals and I write them down and I share them loudly. Uh, one of them was one day I wanted to get a house on Nantucket. Uh, for those listening, it's an island off of Massachusetts. Some people might know it. Some people may not. One of the most beautiful places I've been in the world. I stepped foot on there when I was 21. I fell in love and was like, one day I want to have a house here. And um, I shared it with my sales team at the kickoff of the year. This is what I'm working towards. And I also want to be able to send my kids to any school that's right for them. And I have a house in Nantucket. Uh, I have a daughter in a fabulous private school, another one in public school. And so, you know, I've hit, I've hit a few of those goals. Uh, right now, I want to make sure my kids can go to college. I'm hoping that I'm saving money to pay for their weddings one day and, um, and also just retirement math. So I get motivated by short-term, mid-term, and long-term goals. I'm constantly work, working on my one-year plan, my two-year plan, my five-year plan, my 10-year plan, and uh, I, try to, I try to stick to them. And I get a lot of pride when I get to knock one of those goals down. Yeah. You don't seem like the retired type. I don't know. But I'm sure, I'm sure you'll be able to before you want to. Yeah. Yeah. Retirement for me means probably starting my own business in some way, shape or form. So I also don't think of myself as like sitting, sitting down and like translating Latin or, or knitting or something like that, but just having that nice nest egg. Yeah. Well, so, well, we're all waiting for the, the, the invite to the Nantucket place. Uh, that's a beautiful spot. So um, back to the technology stuff, AI, huge topic these days means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. How are you seeing successful leaders, successful managers leverage AI um, running their business, leading their teams? I don't know if any organization has nailed AI, right? I think it. I think everyone's still experimenting and um, had a cool engagement with McKinsey this week, have a, uh, talking about this conversation. Uh, you know, the timing right now is is cool, Matt. You and I are chatting the week of 
uh, inbound for HubSpot. They just came out with all this new AI functionality, um, you know, for their CRM. Uh, Salesforce is going all in on uh, AI as well. And um, they just beefed up a lot of their features that they announced at Dreamforce. So I, I think the first one is uh, really, here would be my recommendation to any organization. One, have an owner of uh, sales productivity that's outside of a sales leader, uh, somebody in RevOps who owns productivity. That person, you know, is going to be um, an outside perspective and isn't going to be biased in saying, look at how great my team is on productivity. They should be building out, this is what productivity per rep should and could look like. And here are the tools we have in-house already that have an AI layer that can help us improve productivity and like have a real strategy behind it. So for us, we use outreach. What are the AI components that we have in outreach? If you have Salesforce or HubSpot, how can you utilize AI there uh, when it comes to, you know, your uh, email personalization? Can you use Zoom and recapping calls, next action items, next steps? So so many tech stack in the sales productivity space today and the MarTech space today, they have an AI layer. So just starting there. And then the other one is how, as an organization, um, really having goals on how you can be more efficient in, um, in your overall OPEX. So, you know, where can you operate as a company better using AI? And so I think there just needs to be a commitment at the organization level on optimization there. So thanks. I interviewed a while back, uh, Dr. Howard Dover. So he's a professor um, in at the University of Texas and uh, does a lot to run the sales program there. And I remember the conversation and he talked about concerns over the focus on productivity and efficiency versus effectiveness, like how am I showing up better for my prospect or client? And an example would be like for efficiency and productivity is let's say a dialer, right? A dialer will, you know, help me. Right? Um, or I can put a bunch of, bunch of uh, emails in a sequence and, you know, blast that out to people. And that'll, you know, from a productivity perspective, that's super, super charging the, those efforts. But it, you know, dialers and, and, and uh, sequences don't necessarily help prospects and clients. It doesn't help me necessarily with my skills. Never thought on, on that one way or the other. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, listen, uh, Gong, I think is a great tool that you are getting insights into the art of the conversation. So, mm -hmm. you know, certainly using those insights, I remember, uh, when we, we engaged with Gong in the early days of Gong, as well as when I was at HubSpot. And, you know, we would take a look at what are the phrases that our top 20% of reps are using? You know, what are the phrases that are near bottom 20% of reps are using too much of? And so being able to just use those insights, I think is an important one for sure. Um, and you can't, you can't, uh, productivity is not going to save effective human connection. So I think you're hundred percent right there, Matt. Like that's what you're saying is, you know, we can't assume that more is better. Uh, and more doesn't just mean you can have fewer headcount. And I think that's that's the fear of some in sales. Is AI going to take my job? Um, and it's not about being more productive. It's being smarter in the way that you use your time. And I think the best metric for leaders to use is, are we improving customer-facing time? Hmm. Are your reps having more meetings face-to-face, -face, you know, through Zoom? Um, are they having more meetings? Are they connecting with customers more? And can they spend less time on the task-oriented minutia, you know, and using tools in order to remove some of the task burden that they deal with so that they're, they're in front of customers interacting more? Yeah, I um, interviewed Mark Cosagro, and his, I loved his comment. He said more, M-O-R-E. So more is the lazy person's uh, answer to, yeah. to problems. Meaning, hey, I'm not making my number. Oh, do make more calls. Do send more emails. That's the lazy sales manager's answer to, uh, you know, coaching and working with reps. And you, you said it, a similar thing in a different way. So uh, really uh, appreciate that. So Michelle, you're, you're at Bill now. Yes. Um, for those who don't know what Bill is, can you tell us what Bill does 
And then what attracted you there? What do you, what do you love about your opportunity there? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, so Bill is the leading platform. We were actually the category creator when it comes to fueling accounting firms, as well as those who work in finance to pay their bills more effectively uh, from an accounts payable and accounts receivable perspective. On top of that, we also have a lending arm where we help fuel small, medium-sized businesses uh, grow grow their companies through um, through our Divi expense management platform and uh, Divi Card. Um, awesome company. You know, we just exited our last fiscal year at 1.3 billion in revenue. We're publicly traded and uh, great people. I can't speak more highly enough. And we're hiring for anyone who's listening. Uh, fabulous, fabulous group of people. And, you know, uh, Matt, Matt, you mentioned this kind of early, I think we're kicking things off. Um, you know, my uh, founder at HubSpot, Brian Halligan, uh, had given me this this advice once, and he mentioned this often to the company, you know, your career shouldn't, doesn't necessarily have to be a straight line up. You can really kind of zigzag. And I've always looked at my career as a portfolio of work. And what really excited me about, you know, making the move over to Bill you know, I was coming from MarTech, sales productivity tech, the CRM space. Bill is in this fintech payment space, which was really new for me. I had been doing SaaS for about 10 years, 11 years um, at, uh, by the time I departed HubSpot. And so for me, the intellectual stimulation, the learning something new, the expanding my portfolio of uh, work into the fintech space was a really exciting opportunity. And um I, I nerd out on learning. So I was really excited to make the move over here. Nice. And uh, if people uh, are interested in learning more and may want to join the Bill team, what, what's, how, where do they go? Uh, yeah, I would just go to bill.com. Uh, easiest, uh, easiest way to do it. Go to our careers page. Um, I would ask that people not uh, LinkedIn me directly uh, pitching me there or sending me their resume, although uh, that's okay, but I end up getting inundated. The best place really to go is at um, uh, bill.com and go to our careers page. All right. We'll put that in the show notes. Uh, so, Michelle, uh, you did talk about Brian, I think you mentioned, uh, whose advice shaped you and, and, and a lot of others. But I asked this question of all the guests. You know, you, you're someone who cares about coaching and developing others. People who view that world through that lens, usually had that behavior modeled for them. Can you talk about someone uh, in, in your career whose coaching has had a significant outsized impact on, on, uh, on what you're doing today and who you are? Yeah, I'll give you two. Uh, the most important one, Matt, that we had talked about was my dad. Uh, so I was very, very lucky to have a dad who um, he was really involved in both my academics as well as my athletic career. I was a junior Olympic softball pitcher and he came with me to, you know, see a pitching coach every single week. I pitched throughout the winter and he was my catcher. And so I kind of had this built in coach in both areas of my life and then also kind of on the, the mindset side. And um, he really spent a lot of time talking about potential. And I like to do this with my people as well. I just had a conversation with a, a strategist today about, you know, listen, like your work doesn't only have to exist in, you know, what you do day in, day out. If you think we can do something better at the company, lean into that. You have the potential to make a bigger impact and outsize impact. If you see it, don't hesitate um, and put a proposal together. And I think a lot of people like to point uh, these are all the problems. Fewer people, you know, take the time to say, I think I have a solution to a problem that I see. And so my dad did a really nice job of coaching me in that way. The other one I would I would mention is um, Yamini Rangan, who's the CEO of HubSpot today. Uh, she was the hardest boss I've ever had, hardest on me. Uh, I probably cried more one-on-ones with her than I've ever cried. And at the same time, I, I always felt like she was my biggest cheerleader. And, you know, it was always about the expectation she had of me and my work and where she thought I needed to lean in. And if I wasn't delivering, it, it wasn't about me as a person. It was about I wasn't reaching the potential and delivering at the high level, that high caliber level that I could. And um, and she was also very distinct in the areas in which I needed to strengthen my game and the muscles. And so I really appreciate that specificity. And I think, Matt, that's one of the points you keep getting to is 
you have to develop people in the areas in which they're weak, not just tell them, hey, you're weak, get better. And um, I was really lucky to have people who leaned in and, and cared to give me that kind of coaching. Thanks for, for sharing both of those. And you, you went in a different direction than I thought you were at the end there. You said, uh, don't just say I'm weak. Tell me where I'm weak, I think is what, what you said. Yes. And then the, the next best step is and how to get better there. That's what it was. And, you know, I saw a, a post um, not too long ago, uh, actually yesterday, I saw a post where somebody said, I wish I could remember the person's name. They said, don't just tell me I'm doing a good job unless you tell me specifically what was good about it, because that's when I can know what, um, where maybe my strengths are, what I can do more of, you know, and the post went on basically to say, like, we throw around that, hey, great job. Are oh, you doing a great job? Keep it up. But it's too general. And it's the same thing with <laughs> you suck. Well, okay. At what? Like, what do I suck at? Like, I'm, I'm willing to get better at it, but let's be specific. And then let's talk together about uh, how, how to get better. So I think the, what you're talking about with the Omni is that level of specificity that that she brought to the table that is instructive and, and is uh, coaching. So awesome. And, and by the way, when Michelle talked about her dad as being a great coach, um, for anybody who wants to see an emotional and authentic post, go to uh, look at what Michelle posted uh, earlier this week. And if that doesn't touch your soul, um, you're not human. With that being said, how have you thought about your career as it's evolved. I mean, you talked about it's a portfolio and, you know, anything to add on to that, like for, for people that are just starting out, like, you know, we, we think about the ladder, but you, yeah. you've, you've mentioned the portfolio. I know you touched on it, but care to make any more comments about that? Yeah. It's been really interesting as my, as I've kind of moved up in my career map, like I, I'm having conversations about my career weekly with, with mentors of mine. And, um, you know, I'll tell you, I joined a public board a year ago, and it was something that was a goal of mine that I thought I'd probably reach, you know, at some point, maybe in my mid 50s. And um, I'm, I'm 44 years old. Uh, my hope is my Botox tells you otherwise. Um, but, you know, what it takes in order to get into a board or to get onto more boards, um, you know, those are the conversations I'm having about, okay, how do I structure? my uh, career today in order to set me up for what I'm hoping to to do in the next 10 or 15 years. So I think about that. Um, the other one is- Michelle, can I, can, I, can I interrupt there? So there's a lot of people that I'm, I'm older, I'm older than you and the gray hair will tell you that and the eyes, but the, yes, Botox, we'll talk about that later. Uh, for people who want to get on boards, for people who aren't asked, there's well, people with a ton of talent that think, well, I think I can offer a lot of value and they can, but they might not be known. Um, you know, is there a way, I mean, can you raise your hand and say, hey, you know what I want? I'd like to be on a board. I mean, what's your advice to people who have not been asked yet, but could bring something to the table and want to have a position like that? Yeah, it's a great question. So I, I was asked, I was, I was approached by a recruiting firm and, um, I would say, Matt, I, I network well, and I also hate networking. And so I'll, I'll tell you what I mean by that. You know, back when I used to do more like door-to-door -door business to business sales, you know, there'd be like a chamber of commerce event or rotary club event. I hated being the person who was in the room and I went to interrupt a conversation or I was lingering, waiting for two people to stop talking. And that makes me feel super uncomfortable. But what I have done is I'm a member of Pavilion. I'm a huge proponent of, uh, of Pavilion for revenue leaders out there. And I would attend events. I'd, you know, I'd attend a, a Zoom coffee. Um, I would go to a meetup and I'd go to a dinner. And um, I made this a commitment to myself. I'm going to spend four hours a month networking. And uh People would want to learn about HubSpot or, hey, I'd love to pick your brain on, you know, segmentation or a problem I'm going through. Wonder if you've gone through this. I take the calls. 
I take the calls from recruiters. I like to hear what are the roles that are out there? What are the ones that might be right for me? What are the compensation profiles looking like? Um, how does my experience stack up? I mean, I, I'm rarely looking for a job. Um, I actually, I, I don't think I've ever looked for a job. I've been uh, recruited, but I take the calls because I like to know the recruiters. I like to know the landscape, you know, the competitive landscape and some of the other companies hiring. I think being spending a certain number of hours a month working on your career, on your network, um, people that are your peers. I call, I, I've called peers of mine at other companies, Zoom video, how are you guys doing your segmentation? Twilio, how are you guys managing your lead process? Do you have SDRs on your leads? Are your reps managing your leads? What's working for you? I just, you know, write people on LinkedIn and I want to learn from other leaders at similar companies to mine and ask how they're operating. As time goes on, there's compound interest that that starts to develop. And people know that you are, you know, intellectually curious and you're a student of the game. And so I think that's that's helped me out. I've chosen great companies to work at. So I think that's that's helped too. Great. Intellectually curious, student of the game. Your network is your net worth. And what I loved about what you said is four hours a month. That's an hour a week, an hour a week. It's not 10 hours a week. Um, yep. it, you know, anybody, anybody can do it. So um, really cool. So quite a little funny, fun question here as we start to wrap up. Who's your favorite coach? Real, fictitious, doesn't matter. I'll give you a good one. I'll give you a good one, especially as a Boston sports fan. Doc Rivers. Doc Rivers. All right. Thought you got to go the Belichick route. Doc Rivers. Met Doc Rivers in the airport one time. Real, real nice guy. What, what, why do you say Doc Rivers? What do, you, what do you like about him? What, what attributes do you respect? He was all about the team dynamics. It was all about the team dynamics. And speaking of being a student of the game, just gave this the speech to my team today. Like I'm a student of high performing teams and what makes them operate well. And I think what he did really well was um, deliver a no egos mindset among the team. And I think especially if you take a look at professional sports, you have so many that have just these, you know, all star outsized players, right? That can make the difference. Uh, in a team, but when you and everyone can put their ego aside and they're they're doing the work for the team, I think a lot of magic happens. And um, there is something really magical when it comes to teams that gel and operate for a higher purpose. So I really love that about him. I think uh, I think he obviously he developed a pretty amazing squad. And uh, so yeah, I'm a big fan of his. Nice. Doc Rivers, shout out. And uh, last question. Um, if you had to give a TED Talk on any topic uh, related to leading, coaching, developing people, what would, topic would you choose and why? I probably would say leaning in to potential. You know, it, uh, there's a great article in a Harvard Business Review, and it's about hiring for potential. And, you know, even today, I, I hear from uh, it, many times over in my career, I've had managers say, I just got this great new hire from this, you know, like amazing company, they're going to come in and do great things and uh, they don't deliver. And it's not about hiring the person necessarily that has the experience. It's also the person who has the potential to grow, the potential to be culturally additive, the potential to bring insights to your organization that you don't have today. Um, so whatever's on their resume, the company on their resume doesn't mean they're going to come in and be an all-star. Uh, but their potential has a much higher uh, likelihood that they're going to step up and grow into something pretty, pretty great. So I think it's about how do you tap into potential as you're developing people? You know, how do you have that conversation and how do you hire for potential? So that's that's probably one of the areas I'd lean into. Yeah. And you know, not being seduced by the prospects of potential, but, you know, focusing on what people have demonstrated in the past that they've they're intellectually curious and they're going to bring something to the table and they're, they're getting better at getting better uh, as the years, at the years, as the years go by. So, um, love that Michelle. Um, that's a good place to leave it. We covered a lot of ground today. Um, we, you know, we talked about the importance of networking and boards. We talked about having an outsized impact. We talk about a career as a, as a portfolio, not a, not a ladder, a, a zigzag, not, not a straight line. Um, and we, you know, talked about 
making the, the team better um, and not just being kind of in it for yourself and having promotions not just be a given. So uh, a lot of different stuff there. Thank you so much for investing your time with us today. Thank you, Matt. Loved being here with you. And for everybody out there watching and listening, thanks for doing that. If you like it, tell us what you liked. If you would like to see something specific, let us know what you'd like to see more of. We want to bring content and guests to you that are interesting and provide actionable takeaways like Michelle did today. So whether you're watching it on YouTube or listening to it on Spotify or wherever you get your podcast, uh, give us a like, give us a subscribe, turn on your notifications, all that stuff. That helps us make sure that we're getting to the most people and helping people do what they're doing every day just that little bit better, giving them that extra spark. So thank you for all. And until next time, coach them if you want to keep them. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Coach to Scale, How Modern Leaders Build Coaching Cultures. For show notes and other episodes, visit us at coachem.io. That's C-O-A-C-H-E-M dot I-O. And follow us on Twitter at Coachem Now. See you all next week. Thanks for joining. And remember, coach them if you want to keep them.